His studio is based in Milan and has offices in Shanghai and Tirana and is currently involved in international projects such as the General Local Plan Tirana 2030 and the development in several cities in the world of the prototype of the vertical forest built in Milan in 2014. The discussion will be chaired and moderated by Claudio Zanfi, editor of Green Island. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to everybody, thank you for being here. Thanks a lot, especially to Patrick Blanc for this uh, meeting this afternoon. Thanks to Stefano Boeri for organizing all this also. And um, I think we would like to start immediately with uh, some uh, images by Patrick. He prepared a special presentation mainly dedicated to the nature, which is the aim of his work, of course. And then probably we can go on and, uh, with some question and from the also from the public. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, bonjour. Uh, actually, uh, just a few minutes ago, I did say to, to Stefano, I did prepare something without uh, my work uh, because uh, I think it's more interesting uh, here to explain how about human forest, uh, how the plants are growing in the nature in some way similar to what we try to do in our cities, but Stefano told me, oh, you are crazy, I want to, we want to see your work, but so here you see only <laughs> nature, because we have never to forget that actually what is a concrete, concrete, everybody thinks it's artificial, but not at all, of course, concrete is an accumulation in the oceans, uh, actually limestone and uh, cast after when the uh, 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 police uh, create uh, cast uh, mountains. It's actually made uh, by mollusks and uh, mostly mollusks in the oceans. And after what we do, we, we cut this, uh, these uh, stones in very small pieces and we make an agglomeration to create concrete. So concrete actually is made mostly of animals. So it's why I want to see, to show you many photos in nature where the <coughs> natural concrete, I mean, uh, the cast uh, towers in uh, m many places of the world, even uh, if uh, you go in the Dolomites, uh, just 100 kilometers from here, you see very beautiful examples of forest growing directly on cast limestone. And, uh, uh, what is it's important, I think, is that in, uh, in the work concerning the, your, the especially high rise building, Forest, same as uh, your Bosco Verticale, it's always platforms, but I think there is still work to do concerning installation of plants between two layers of concrete or other material to have really plants emerging from the, <coughs> the, the, the cliffs, because actually uh, uh, our buildings are kind of cliffs, to, to have another approach of the interaction between the plant and the, uh, the high rise building. How we can. Uh, 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 it's me? <laughs> so you see the famous Halong Bay? I, I can see here. Uh, okay, so you see uh, cast towers which are exactly the same height as most buildings because usually they are, most of them are between 80 and 220 meters high. So it's uh, really the size of uh, <coughs> our uh, towers. And uh, you see on the, this uh, cast tower that the uh, forests are growing on the top of uh, these towers. And I think it's interesting also to, 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 to think about also this kind of a high rise building with tower, with forests mostly at, at the top and uh, not, not always all along the, the surfaces. Uh, and uh, limestone is very, very special because you have, due to 
the, the fact that it's made of uh, calcium carbonate. Uh, you have erosion of especially chemical erosion with dissolution of this uh, car carbon that calcium with, with the high temperature of the water on high CO2 uh, content which creates holes at uh, the famous caves and you have trees growing on the so this is the famous James Bond Island which looks a little bit like your your Bosco Verticale because <laughs> this place uh, in South Thailand is known by everybody but uh, most people don't realize that actually you have really forest trees at different stages, different heights of this island. So in, in some way it's uh, not far from your work. Eh? And, uh, but it's uh, very interesting for that. So you see you have different shapes. On, for instance this uh, limestone cliff in the middle you have cycads and amorphophallus. So <coughs> what is important to consider is that in the cast tower you have big holes. It means that the plants with big seeds like cycads or amorphophallus can germinate inside the holes. It's not the case for plants with very small seeds. So you see all this, this is in Hokkaido in the southern Japan where you see the natural habitat of cycads revoluta. You have cycads revoluta everywhere in Italy where it's not too cold but this is the natural habitat that you take this photo in Hokkaido and you see in some cases you have very interesting and this is possible to do Stefano in a, on a cliff if you have two layers in order to really have a good anchorage of the roots on the, <coughs> on the wall. You see this cycas also with totally hanging stems <coughs> you, so you see they install and why they install because the seeds you can see the seeds are very big seeds so they can germinate inside holes and you see this photo I did take just uh, four days ago in uh, northern Thailand and you see this amorphophallus species with uh, growing totally in a hole so these habitats are perfect I think that for architecture we have to take inspiration also not only with terrace, it's very beautiful, but also really with different structure which allows to have plants at different places. So you see this incredible ficus, you see, hanging totally down from, uh, from a cliff in uh, southern Thailand. So it's very beautiful because you see the contrast between the stone the old stems totally white and the green leaves. Uh, this is a begonia also close to the sea, so you see structure. And what is important for this plant is to live a long time. And you see that this begonia, actually, when one stem is dying, you have many new stems arising from the base. So potentially, these plants are immortal. They cannot die because they regenerate. So it's very important also in the project of architecture to think about plants which have not too big woods but which can generate again from the base like this. So, so this is just 100 kilometers north, north of here. It's a pinus mugo in the Dolomites mountain, eh, just very close to here. So you see it's not only in tropics that you can see these plants emerging from the rocks. This is in a very cold place in Korea and Again, you see that it's possible to have different ways in architecture to have plants emerging from very narrow, narrow spaces. It's very cold, minus 20 degrees. You see this pinus also in, a, in a Korea, in a close to Seoul, minus 20, minus 25 each winter. So even in this very cold environment, it's possible to have plants growing underworks. So you see this is more tropical. So just also to, see, to show that actually even the building we can have different types uh, shapes with plants at different levels of the surfaces according to the shape. This is in Hawaii Island. So I go quickly to show also that <coughs> in some cases this is in South Africa. You have, uh, it's interesting to have really a, a, a patchwork between plants and stones and different levels. Eh? You, 
This is important because it's uh, in, uh, also in South Africa and you see that all the surface horizontal is totally destroyed by animals grazing all the grasses and the only places where the forest is still alive is only on the vertical cliffs. So you, you see that actually in many cases the vertical forests are the preserve of the only preserve habitat for trees in environments which are either destroyed by human beings to have agriculture or by grazing animals like here in South Africa. Other examples, uh, so it's uh, good, uh, good ideas I think for, for design in architecture. These uh, philodendrons with the beautiful woods covering the rocks a uh, fur in a white, just to show you images of what nature is uh, inventing out. So, this is important, Stefano, because when we think about agrarian building, we of course we have to face the wind, and the strong wind. And actually, this is uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, One thing is very important on this photo is that it's in the south part of New Zealand where it's very, very windy. And when you have towers 200 meters high, we have, we, we have to, to think about plants which can face the wind. And what you see on this photo, you have two types of plants. You have all the shrubs, the dicotyledonous shrubs, which are shaped in the direction of the wind. But what is very interesting, you have the monocotyledon you have the, the cordillet in the middle, and you have also trifer also in the middle, which remain totally straight. It means actually that the wind is not shaping the plant like this. It's simply the fact that the wind strong kills all the upward growing new shoots, and the only surviving ones for the cordillet are the ones growing protected by the trunk. In monocotyledons, like cordyline, you have the apex growing point totally protected by the young leaves. So in this case, it is protected, it cannot die, so it continues to grow vertically. So it's very interesting to see actually that this shape is not due directly to the wind giving this shape, but because all the young shoots at the top. So you see this totally vertical in spite of the wind, because protective. Here, you see the palms also are vertical, this is in Cuba, in spite of the strong wind, because they are protected. Here, you see that actually, the, this shape is like this, because you see all the young stems at the top are destroyed by the wind, and the only surviving ones are the other ones. So, I think it's very important in architecture when we think about very high towers, to, 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 to take in uh, consideration the different, different growth habits of the plants. So you see also this, um, in some ways also, the, you have a kind of crown shyness. Oh, so I show you quickly uh, the beautiful examples of plants growing in much more protected areas. You have mosses. Everybody wants to have mosses growing on walls. I can tell you it's very difficult. All, all these are growing on natural leaves, uh, but it's, uh, it's not easy because uh, mosses need to have always very humid weather. Here you have a ginger uh, with very beautiful flowers, and you see that uh, this ginger on the vertical rock has small tuberized wood which can withstand the dry season. So I show you also the places with waterfalls and mosses. It's you, you see, Stefano, uh, in, in waterfalls, nobody puts plants, but it's possible to have living plants in waterfalls, <laughs> even on high-wise buildings. So, and uh, so you see some examples of this, mosses, and this, this is uh, very special because actually it's not at all natural. It's a question I did do in Bangkok. Uh, you see, I did, because it's very difficult to have mosses growing, but I could select the good ones, and after three years, I did take this photo just a few days ago in, in Bangkok. So you see, we did put slabs like this, rock slabs, 
and water flowing always, and you have mosses growing there. So I show you it quick fast. We go quickly. We know all this just to show you plants growing out of the soil with the roots. We can play also. This is in New Zealand. It's very cold in the south of New Zealand. It's a metro cideros, and when you see roots like this. I think it's interesting, very interesting sight to have to have this kind of of plant. Also, I think in, in architecture we have really also to to think about surprises because well, well, what we want is actually to to try to to, to, to protect what is remaining of the natural biodiversity. So, just for example, some woods you see covering uh, rocks. Or, uh, this in, uh, in Mali, so just to show you embracing roads. Voila. Okay, so, so Cathedral Fighters, this is in the Sulawesi. <laughs> and so I think you have to, 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 to keep in mind all these examples of, a, of a nature with uh, growing. Sometimes woods you see are a kind, kind of, uh, of a sponge. Collecting all the water on the rocks. This is what's in Cuba. Okay, so I go very quickly now just to show you the diversity of the life of plants growing out of the soil, protected by mucilage. Some roots growing upward. Voila. Oh, I go very quickly now. Uh, so, just important to show you that actually on vertical rocks, Many plants have very small, tiny seeds which can germinate only among agae on mosses covering the rocks. And they have cup splash, cup, uh, cup fruit, usually very small, 8 10 millimeters in diameter. And it's a raindrop which, <coughs> which are falling inside the cup on the seeds. Are <coughs> in the, uh, uh, totally uh, put away with the drops of the water and the germinate around the mother plant. So many of begonia. So you see all these tiny seeds. So it's important also uh, when we think about building to have also places, always some places, always humid like this, where you can have algae, mosses, and you see these begonia are germinating <laughs> on these surfaces. So you see. Well, it's longer now. <laughs> but it's just to show you the scale of the very small seedlings germinating here. So this one, to finish the begonia, I did discover also growing on vertical rocks in Philippines two years ago, named after me, as you can see. Uh, so just to show you that plants can come everywhere. Uh, just uh, this was. Uh, uh, I was reading in Kuala Lumpur, oh no, this is in Sydney, in Sydney with uh, Jean Nouvel. So uh, you see, it's not so far from what we can see in nature. There is still a lot of work to do in this direction. This is the work I did do in Bangkok uh, just uh, three years ago, and I did visit it still three days ago, and it's now it's still much, much better than this. Patrick, thank you so much. It's a vision. It's a tour, a vision in the nature, in the forms of nature. And uh, nature always inspires us. It's always more uh, in front of any of our ideas. So uh, we have a very fast uh, series of questions, just five questions. Uh, then we open to the the floor. We are sure there will be many, many questions for both of our guests. So very simply, uh, I will start with Patrick. Mm -hmm. uh, from the tropics to our contemporary city, our western city actually, uh, this vegetation, this fantastic vegetation that you show us, how does it acclimatize? How does it survive well? How does it grow? Uh, you know, I did show you some examples of very, very cold countries like Korea or even the Dolomite. Uh, when I did visit a few years ago Quebec, <laughs> it's very cold. Even in Quebec, on the walls, you see many dwarf conifers, for instance, 
dwarf conifers are absolutely perfect to go in a very narrow uh, crevices, uh, maybe uh, like Copodium, so it's, uh, uh, it, it's not only in tropics you can, uh, you, 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 you see it in New Zealand, New Zealand, the south of New Zealand is not tropical at all, when you go in Chile it's not tropical, in China, in Japan it's not tropical, so even in uh, our countries, it is totally possible to, uh, to have uh, vegetation in a different way, like this particularly. These images uh, tell us about your inspirations, but also about a very strong sense of nature that you try to recreate in your vertical walls. Can you tell a little bit more about these uh, visions? Because actually, you introduce kind of new vision for our cities, or uh, for the idea of uh, not an horizontal garden, but just a vertical one? Uh, actually, uh, what is important is to have a high diversity of plant species. Because if, for instance, on a wall, if you have CP1, IV, climbing, or uh, kind of way climbing, it's not at all image of nature. In, uh, when I see many vertical gardens, uh, uh, when you have five or ten plant species, it's, it's not like nature. As soon as you use at least 50, or in many cases, 200, 200 different species of plants, you have a sensation of nature. Even if in nature, usually you have not, on, uh, on uh, some tens of square meters, you have not so many species, but in the imagination, when we see many species growing together, it means it's very important because if many species are growing together, it means it's a kind of harmony allowing them to stay for a long time. Because of course, a vertical garden, you imagine, you cannot uh, go to, to change the plants uh, yeah, yeah, uh, even, even every year. So when you see many species growing together, why you have impression of nature? It's because you see it's for a long time, so it means that the interactions between these species are positive interactions or no interactions, but no competition. When you see an IV climbing on, on a wall, it's like a cancer invading the wall. When you see 200 species growing on a vertical garden, it's something stable and I think it becomes suddenly a very positive image when you have many species on. I told you when I did visit with you, Stefano, your Bosco Verticale, I, I was surprised because they, I, I told you, wow, you have so many species. So uh, I did consider it was very, very important. And of course, it's useful for parasites and the, all the things we know when more species you have. So, so. Uh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so we are talking about uh, diversity, biodiversity in a square meter, and also consociation. So how the different plants can dialogue between one between the other, one each other, and the roots have a dialogue also between them. This is also for Stefano Boeri on your vertical uh, forest, vertical architecture. Uh, there is quite a richness of uh, diversity. Can you tell us a bit, a bit about this uh, uh, work? Because it's also research. Yeah, it's a research and uh, well, just to go back to the beginning, because I, I remember well that at the beginning when we were proposing the concept of the vertical forest, uh, the skepticism of our colleagues was basically about the uh, possibility of trees to grow and 10, 18, 80, 90, 100, 120 meters. And uh, uh, so the skepticism was about, well, we are doing something impossible. Then when we have done it, and uh, the skepticism now is more about uh, uh, what are, have you done? So in a certain way, uh, the critic is you have hidden it, architecture. You have put trees and architecture has disappeared. Uh, I think these two, uh, these two uh, variations of skepticism are, are, are clues of how we still don't uh, understand how nature could be present as a basic component of, uh, 
uh, architecture. And uh, I'm honest, I think that uh, uh, Le Col Francais, French school, uh, landscape, botanist, who has a lot to do with biology and botanism, uh, has taught us in the last uh, decades uh, how it's possible to bring back nature or to imagine that uh, an artificial building, which is in any case done by natural elements, could host living nature. And uh, I think that uh, from one side, in a certain way, what she came up have done with this theory of her landscape, so nature which is coming back, uh, where you have abandoned urban environments, uh, was one perspective. But uh, the perspective of it by Patrick was for me uh, extremely, extremely fertile. And, uh, it's uh, what he was showing us was exactly that, that it's possible, it's always possible to imagine that our artificial construction could allow living nature to grow, to extend, to expand, to also introduce that kind of unpredictable future that normally nature introduces everywhere. So basically this is what we do, so we are doing houses for trees. I, I'm very serious on that, Laura Gatti, I think she's here with us, she's working on since a lot of time, and what we do is from the beginning to select trees, to select plants. It depends from the different climate conditions where we are asked to work, and uh, then we create the facade of our building in relation with the void, with the three-dimensional void that every plant, every tree, every shrub uh, uh, needs or requests. Uh, and that's the uh, first fundamental step of our approach to relation with the uh, city, city and nature. Uh, yes, this is, as you can see at first, uh, an idea of how we normally work. So the composition of facade is connected with uh, uh, the biodiversity of uh, living species. And uh, maybe we can see some examples of what we are doing. Okay, otherwise you can go back. Stefano, um, I go back to... This is a, oh, yes. that's about maintenance, but it was another very, very serious issue. So from the beginning, the question was, well, okay, you, you have uh, uh, 21,000 plants in these two buildings, uh, which is equivalent of two hectares and half of a real forest, mm -hmm. but in a surface of 1,100 square meters. So this is an issue, no? that's a serious issue. We, are, we can nowadays to create an ecosystem which has equivalent in terms of number of plants, so also think to the advantages that the forest of two x and a half could have at the center of a very polluted and density like Milano, but in a surface of 1,000 per gigantic square meter. So that relation is in a certain way the best way to, to legitimate the experiment of, of the vertical forest. And uh, these are more or less some of the uh, variation of the field that we are doing in different, part, uh, uh, in different parts of the world. And as you can see, the base starting point is always connected with the, with the trees, with the plants, with the different species, and the way we can host them. So we are changing uh, also the supports. We are using balconies, we are using lodges, we are using poles, we are using roofs. But uh, I think that uh, what, what uh, Patrick showed us was, was great. And for sure, the other uh, basic element that we are always considering is a contribution that this kind of uh, 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 dense and uh, in a certain way hybrid ecosystems, because basically the relation in this building is that for one uh, human, we have uh, two or three trees, uh, eight or 10 brush, and 20 or 30 plants of different nature. So, it's a very important for us to demonstrate how this vertical ecosystem can contribute to absorb CO2, to absorb the dust of urban pollution, to implement biodiversity, to reduce the consumption of energies. Uh, just to give you an example, in Milano, uh, the tenants are not using the conditions of early summertime because shade of plants is it's in itself amazing. And that's a, a building that is construction in Eindhoven. Uh, we are very proud of that. This is a social house in the vertical forest. So, the cost of this will be less than 1,200 for square meter, which is nothing. Uh, it's totally prefabricated, and uh, it's, a, it's for us a very important step forward in the idea that it's possible to do this also for, for, for Thank you, Stefano, very much. We will go and back. This is in good. This is only just a couple. This is a, a 
Paris Vertical Forum, which is structural and timber and wood, to totally. Thank you. A lot of steps and developments. We go back a little bit with this idea of uh, sustainability and maintenance. I have some question about this later on. Um, I go back, Patrick. Um, this is a special question for you. We know that you have a very special, peculiar, let's say, collection of seeds and roots and birds Fantastic. and fishes and, and some other more incredible animals, butterflies. Uh, last time I met the president, we were in Myanmar, and he was there to collect uh, seeds. That any, so any, he's any a real explorer, of, a pure of, explorer. Of living, uh, of, of his <laughs> forbidden to import in France, of course, in Europe, but we know. And, um, and so, um, can you tell us a little bit about this and about the germination? And what is interesting, all these living uh, beings, uh, plants and insects, they live with you, together with you in your house, in your studio. Uh, yes, yes, uh, maybe we can see some images on the second, second, uh, second one. But uh, uh, yes, uh, when we speak of, uh, about ecosystem, you know, uh, when I was a, a, a tiny boy, uh, when I was uh, about five, six years old, I had the birds in a cage. On uh, every Thursday, because it was on Thursday or Sunday that uh, we were free, did not go to school. And I did open the cage of the birds in order that they fly inside the house, and after they came back in the cage. So I did always like this idea to have animals around us, but in some way free. And now uh, in my home, it's, uh, it's the same. I have a, a huge floor, it's, uh, it's uh, like, like this. And it's uh, not, not so high because uh, it's only 50 centimeters high, but uh, uh, seven by seven meters. So I have uh, 25,000 liters of water and uh, two or 3,000 fishes inside. So on the uh, all around vertical gardens, and on the vertical gardens, all the birds in the home are flying. <coughs> I have also some lizards uh, on the walls and uh, uh, also some frogs on the leaves. So uh, uh, I, I love this idea to, 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 to live in uh, really in a kind of, of forest and all the plants in my home, again I should not say that, but all are souvenir plants that I collect in forest. So you see I came uh, yesterday from uh, from Bangkok and uh, uh, still again, I did, I, I did put in my suit uh, some, some plants. And to <coughs> it's not, uh, on vertical gardens, uh, I, I cannot put them in quantities because when I make a huge vertical gardens, I need uh, so 200, 500 uh, plants. So I have, I have to work with nurseries, but this is a very interesting way also. In the countries where I go, for instance, in Malaysia, in Hong Kong, in uh, in California, I always visit all the local nurseries to see which plants are available. And I love the project when I have, <coughs> sorry, two or three years ahead because I can, some nurseries which are very interesting plants, I can ask them to propagate during one or two years, saying, oh, this one you have only five, but I need 50, I need 100. In Australia also, I can do this in Sydney. So it's a, a very interesting part of the work to be in connection with the local nurseries because it's always uh, very interesting people which are really uh, invested in, the, in their work, uh, engaged engage in their work. So... <coughs> oh, it's, it's okay. I'll not die now, I think. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, you, 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 you see, it's a, uh, when we speak about uh, ecosystem, it's a really inside the work we do to have animals. We see birds uh, with, uh, with uh, eggs in your, uh, in your vertical garden, in uh, your Bosco verticale. Uh, in my home, it's the same, but also the connection with the people growing the plants. And uh, I love this because it's a uh, it's also very funny because usually the, the white people going in a, in a nursery in a, in a remote place in Indonesia or, or Malaysia always are interested by the same orchids or 
the common plants. And when they see me looking at a very special plant that they have in a, in a, in a remote corner, and I say it's interesting, so ah, they don't understand why uh, a foreigner is interested by this plant. So it creates a, a really good relationship. So it's a, uh, at all levels, actually, when you work with the plants like this, it's, a, it's really a new adventure. Uh, uh, and the, diversity of uh, not only the biodiversity but also diversity of, uh, of people and I think that well, when you look at a vertical garden with many plant species it's also the same you feel you come back in nature you come back in a kind of nursery when you could grow these plants suddenly you have all these images of another way of life uh, when you look at this so we can talk also thank you so much for this uh, also it's uh, it's like a dream. All of us, we would like to live into a house. So you, you see the difference between this bridge Before, with nothing yeah. and uh, with the plants. It's not images, it's the truth. And it's, <laughs> so you see it's a canyon street ugly in Paris. So you see with plants in Hong Kong. So you see what amazing. A technical question, just a curiosity. It's not too humid to live in your house with all this uh, mist, uh, just to, to leave the plant grows and the birds and the butterflies. You open the windows because and the, air, the, fresh birds, comes in. the birds remain in the plant, so we can open the windows and they don't fly away. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for this vision. And uh, now I would like to go a little bit, we still have 10 minutes, on more technical question for both of you, so Stefan if you want to answer first and then uh, you Patrick, how does this idea started for the vertical green or for the vertical architecture? I would like to know if you had some inspirations uh, on historical, of course we can talk about the Babylon garden starting from there on, but if you the both of you, uh, if you had some artistic inspiration, special uh, uh, image, uh, or a sound, for example, you like it very much, the birds and the sounds of birds, S some special point that inspired you, Stefano? Well, well no, uh, sure. I normally used to quote uh, a very important novel by Italo Calvino, mm -hmm. The Baron on the Trees. Was written in 1955. Probably you know it was amazing. Uh, Frederick Underklasser was an yes. artist, and yeah, 1970 was present also in Milano with this idea that uh, every tree should be considered as a tenant. So he was the first to do this. Now let me quote other two. One is for sure uh, John Lloyd Boyce, because what John Lloyd Boyce did in a castle. 1982, where he was gathering 7,000 battle stones and then buying them and then transforming the both 7,000 ox trees, oak trees, and they started to, to plant the 7,000 ox everywhere in the city, changing. So it's like a, an urban metamorphosis from artificial to a new landscape. And then why not Adriano Celentano? Let me. What he means a very, very famous Italian. Singer, but in, uh, in the 70s was, was written a song called uh, Un albero di 30 piani, a 30 floor tall uh, tree. Um, but, well, inspiration are, are, are everywhere. There's a, a tower in Lucca, the Torre Luigini, and uh, Patrick uh, Colibien, uh, which is a tower with uh, trees on the top, uh, built in uh, the 14th century. So, yeah, that's about inspiration. But, uh, Thank you, and then actually I think it, what, what Patrick showed us at the beginning was extremely inspiring. So that, you know, that was more on, on, on the natural side. Culturally, artistically, what inspired you when you, when you designed? Only nature, absolutely. Only nature. No, nobody else. No, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. no. artistic. Karl Marx who did do many things in Brazil, he did never create vertical garden. No, no. He did make uh, ugly things with the stones on Bromeliads, but he did do wonderful works in many cases, but 
uh, what is it why vertically was uh, not in, no no the only nature but it's, it's enough because the <laughs> it's <more than> enough. <laughs> nature <laughs> my poor life is not enough to have inspiration I tell you I just uh, came back uh, yesterday morning from uh, from Thailand on the in northern Thailand because it was very interesting because in mountains in northern Thailand it's a kind of mix between temperate and tropical climate because the uh, the highest mountain is 2,500 meters high. So it was very interesting because you see both tropical plants and also a kind of autumnal effect. So on the trees, there are some ferns with totally yellow brown leaves, and just close to this, in patience, with totally flowering. So it's a, it's a very, 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 like a fairy tale where you see all these mosses and a, a mix of tropics and autumn, so inspiration. You, you see, uh, every time, uh, again, three days ago, uh, I did see this for the first time at the end of November, I did never go at this season, so it, uh, always uh, I find new inspiration in nature. So, yes, and of traveling a lot because you also travel very much for your research, for your collection. But, uh, you, you see, I did go to, to Thailand because I have a project uh, with the same lady at the Rainforest Chandelier and uh, I have uh, two new projects with her so I had uh, three days of a meeting only three days I did tell her no no I stop after three days and after I did take uh, ten days to go in the uh, parts of, uh, of uh, <coughs> Middle Thailand or Northern Thailand where I didn't even go in this season so every time I go for a project for Vertical Garden always I go to the forest one and a half months ago, I did my conference in South Brazil, in Brazil, in Florianopolis. Of course, I did. I had two days of conference, and after I did move for ten days in the forest of South Brazil, where I did never go before. So, so always. And, and this morning we met. We met in a real forest. No? Yes, yes. On this morning we were at uh, Bosco Fontana. I think it's a place where we should all go. It's amazing. It's an ancient forest, 15 kilometers from, from the center of Malta, where we have seen amazing things. Thank you. Just the last uh, couple of questions and then we open to the floor. Uh, so, today we know that we have some urgencies about uh, climate changing, about uh, ecologies, back many, 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 many urgencies. So, does this vertical green walls uh, solve, in a way, not only the question of uh, climate changing, but also the question of the use of soil, Stefano? Sure, I think uh, from a certain point of view, uh, if we go back <coughs> to what is happening on the planet, uh, and we consider, it's uh, one of the statements of this, of this forum, that uh, cities are occupying probably not more than the 3% of the major land of the planet, but they produce 70-75% of the CO2 that in the atmosphere is the cause of the climate change. And then uh, uh, ice melting, uh, rise up on the level of the ocean. So cities are uh, at the origin uh, of climate change and in a certain way they are also the first victims of climate change. Uh, that's uh, just uh, uh, some images that shows how much city are in a certain way physically small. If we could concentrate all that is organ in one part of the planet, it's nothing. But at the same time, you see how much they produce. So this is the three percent. So basically, it's Europe. But on the other side, forests are uh, absorbing together with the ocean because they are particularly done by the ocean. It's, uh, 35 40 percent of that of that CO2. You now, this is a, as we are gathering of the forest. So, I think this, this image is quite strong. So, uh, what we uh, seriously could imagine to do is we multiplicate the number of, uh, of trees, the number of plants, the number of shrubs, the number of green surfaces, the biological surfaces on, on the horizontal and vertical surfaces of our city. It's really to drastically drastically reduce the effect of climate change. And say reverse, but for sure to slow its effects. Uh, that's another image to show how much urban Pangea is not simply about physical concentration, but it's also about networks. So there is a kind of technosphere, how Peter Heff is saying, 
which is conditioning in the life of the planet, which is done by our species. So the Anthropocene is exactly the product not simply of the concentration in the urban environment, but also by all the technical infrastructure, the material infrastructure that our species are creating the planet. Uh, in this context, I think that urban forestry is a, it's a very crucial issue because it's a, probably one of the most efficient ways to deal with climate change because it can produce in a very short time uh, some amazing, amazing effect in, in, a, in many, many different fields. So just think how much you can reduce the process of healthy. So the uh, urban island, um, the uh, it, eating the urban heat is uh, one of the main issues sure that uh, uh, this is what we are doing in Tirana, it was a city completely in uh, concrete, it was grey, grey, we are planning to have uh, an orbital forest together with a series of green wings that are going to change radically the, the nature of the, the nature of the city. Uh, but basically, vertical forest is uh, a way to introduce uh, like grass some very, very, very dense and powerful ecosystem in a very small urban surface. That's all. Grazie, thank you so much. Patrick, so the same question, so using verticality, we don't use the soil, we don't use the horizontal uh, soil. Is it kind of solving problem also today, for the urgency of today, a part of your pre 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 primary idea? Of course, we, 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 we can say that uh, doing, uh, for instance, in some vertical gardens with the roots totally exposed to the oxygen of the air, so with all the microorganisms, fungi, uh, algae, bacteria, uh, <coughs> so in connection with the roots, of course, absorb a big molecule, we can cut them in smaller molecules that plants can absorb, of course, this is true. It's true that about insulation, it seems, uh, it's true, that <coughs> either horizontal uh, planting as you, as you do, or vertical gardens reduce in some way, one, two, three degrees, the temperature during summer and also during winter and the uh, reverse. So, of course, uh, this, is, uh, this is important, but I think that the most important is uh, the consideration of the people seeing all these environment that they want to protect what is remaining, as I did say before, of natural environments in the world. Hopefully now we have almost 12% of the world the surface protected in one way or another way. Sometimes it's only on paper and it's not really protected. Uh, on the other side, some places not officially protected are huge areas of nature. It's always, we forget this, and hopefully it's true. Uh, I mean, uh, for instance, if you look at the Brazil, the protected areas, and when you look at the real surfaces of almost untouched areas, it's very important <coughs> in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Africa also. But one thing is sure is that 7 billion of human beings in the world is already too much. And uh, when we see that uh, Africa will be growing a lot in the next uh, 20 years or something like that, it's a little bit terrible. When you see that only two countries, India and China, each with 1.3 billion people, are two-fifths of the world planet, and especially India is a big problem because the country is very small, 3.3 million square meters, so one third of China. So they are the same number of people, but one third of the surface. Uh, so, uh, <coughs> of course, I think it's very important to try to solve this uh, problem of uh, overpopulation in, uh, in the world. and. Uh, of course, everybody said that uh, with education, the people will do less and less children. But when you look at the provisions, the forecast, kind of a forecast for, for, uh, for the population of the world, uh, before maybe 15 years ago, 
Everybody did it say, oh, it will stop around 9 million people because of education, blah, blah, blah. And after they did say, oh, maybe 10, after 11, after 12, and now, uh, estimation every year, it's increasing. So, uh, it's a really, really a problem. And what is positive, in, I think, in the work we are doing is that people are more and more conscious of what is really important to preserve and what also I think is important is that now uh, all the human beings think that they are not the only important living things in the world and that not only animals but also plants now are considered as really living creatures which can be respected. So I'm optimistic in this way that we can consider that now every living creature, either of a fungi, a fungus, or bacteria, or animal, or human being, or plant, uh, have the real, really uh, need the same respect. Because <coughs> oh, this is another political problem, but when we consider that the, the people living in one country are responsible about the biodiversity in their country and that uh, they can do what they want. You see, uh, for instance, uh, the last president of uh, Brazil uh, four weeks ago elected who says uh, that he doesn't uh, care about Amazonia. He wants uh, just to have uh, all, all the poor people invading and cutting the forest. And uh, the only problem is that you know that uh, human beings are in a place since usually few centuries, maximum usually 2,000, 5,000 years ago, and the place where they are living and where they think they can decide everything about the, the living things, so they evolved during millions of years, and they are here since only maximum five, 6,000 years, so it means it's absolutely nothing. So why? why people living in a place should have the right to decide what they do with all the local biodiversity of the place that invaded few centuries or few millennia before. So this is uh, an, another problem, but as I told you, hopefully I travel a lot and everywhere you can go in New Guinea, in, uh, I was in Malawi a few, a few months ago, now, everywhere, the people are conscious that all the living things around them have to be respected and are important. So, uh, I hope that uh, we'll, we'll move in a in good direction. direction. In the good direction. Thank you. Part of very interesting, also insects are uh, here much before us and they have to be respected. And, uh, Unfortunately, our time is almost done, the one is already done, <laughs> and uh, uh, we would like to, to talk with you probably for days, but we cannot. Um, if I can, I have a, a last question, then we leave uh, the question for all of you on the floor. Uh, Patrick has, but no, there is no question, there is no time, so no that is question, bene. Um, so thank you, thank you Patrick for your visionary world, for your images uh, that you showed us today. Thank you Stefano uh, for your uh, work, for, for all the future projects that you both uh, are involved in. And uh, I do leave the, 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 the book some questions to the floor, probably. We, we have time, yes. Thanks to you. Grazie, grazie a voi. Thank <laughs> grazie, you. Grazie.